Welcome to the Front End Nerdery Podcast, a podcast about front end development and design. I'm your host, Todd Libby. And today I decided to mix it up a little bit and go with UX, user experience. And my guest today is a UX consultant, speaker, author, musician, and Cleveland Browns super fan himself, Joe Natoli. Joe, how are you today? <laughs> I am excellent, sir. How are you? I am doing well, thank you. Now that I have all the things in where they need to go and everything's all right, <laughs> my mic's in the right laptop, so. <laughs> Amen. Uh, Amen. Well, and we're not even going to talk about the trouncing your team gave mine this past weekend. No, I wouldn't do that. Not at all, 45 <laughs> to 7. But anyways, I think we got a little video. Oh, there we go. Your video froze for a second there, but. All right, so uh, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself? Oh boy, that's a long story. Um, I am essentially, I mean, I, I'm a consultant. I am uh, a teacher at heart, and uh, I've been working in this industry for the last three decades of my life. I split my time between consulting with clients, teaching online courses, uh, of which I am very, very, very fortunate and privileged to have well over 200,000 students at this point. Um, on my own platform, as well as uh, places like Udemy. I speak at conferences and on podcasts whenever anyone will have me, <laughs> because I love to talk about this stuff, as most people know. Um, and uh, I'm, an, I'm an author. I've written several books. I'm working on actually three books at the same time right now, because I'm insane. <laughs> so uh, I split my time between all those things because I, I, I love all of it. You know, there's, there's lots of parts of this profession that really uh, still excite me to this day. And the parts that, that matter most to me are the people parts, right? The great thing about UX and design and development and product uh, of any kind is at the end of the day, there's a lot that we get to do that help people uh, have better lives, right? In any number of ways, whether it's work or personal or otherwise. So um, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Yeah. I actually am a member of the Facebook group, mm -hmm. so I kind of lurk in there from time to time uh, when I venture into that realm of madness, shall we say, called Facebook or Meta or whatever it is. That, or yeah, it's, it is a, this it's, week. it's a tough sell. I mean, <laughs> Facebook is, there, there are lots of reasons, right? Yeah, I, I think if it weren't for the group, I would probably give it up, to be honest with you. Um, but there are so many people there. And so much like direct message activity, number one, that, that uh, I can't see forcing all these people to go somewhere else. Right. But yeah, Facebook's tough. And uh, how did, oh, I was looking up UX courses. Yours came up in a search. Uh, and that was what? Oh, wow, that must have been a year or two ago, maybe more. But um, I don't know. Time is a construct in this COVID thing. So, <laughs> yeah, right. The last two years feels like 10 years. <laughs> yes, it does. It certainly does. So, let's get right into the questions. And I'm going to, sure. my first question is How did you get started in your web design or development uh, UX journey? Well, that's an interesting story. Um, I started out in graphic design and went to school for graphic design. And I was fortunate enough that in that program, the way that we were taught design was not, it was about aesthetics, of course, right? Visual communication, um, visual principles about how elements work together, um, language, typography, imagery, you know, how, how you're sort of telling the story. But the, the key emphasis was on what are you communicating and is it relevant and is it appropriate for the people on the receiving end, right? Which is very, very much a precursor to UX work. So I, I was really lucky. I was working for design firms and ad agencies. And then when this little thing called the internet came about <laughs> and was made public, cause that's how friggin' old I am. Um, <laughs> I could not convince the old rich white men who ran this agency I was working at as a director of a uh, uh, production department. I couldn't convince them that this was a thing. Okay. That they needed to pay attention to this. The clients were going to want to, have web presences that they were going to want, want to have sites that they were going to have. And they were just like, whatever, it's a trend, it'll pass, go make me some coffee. So me being me, 
<laughs> I was I was either dumb enough or naive enough or stubborn enough or angry enough or all, a combination of all those things to say, well, fuck you guys. I'm going to go do it myself. Right. So I left and I said, I'm going to start my own firm. And that was it. That was the extent of my thought <laughs> about <laughs> doing this, which is I don't recommend for anybody. OK, there's some planning that should go into these kinds of decisions. Yes. Um, but man, that's I've kind of always been that person that's like, screw this, let's go. Right? right. So I took one employee with me who was working with me at the time, um, hired two more people in quick succession, and I was lucky. Okay, I hit this internet thing at the time when it exploded, when everybody needed a website. It was the wild west, no one knew what they were doing, right? And clients were like, Well, can we do this? And can we do this? We, they didn't even know what questions to ask. And we didn't have the answers, not me, not anybody. Okay. So the answer to everything was yes. And then in your head, you're going, all right, we got to figure this out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. No one knew anything about, about design and development for the web, especially the coding part. I mean, this was a mystery, right? It was an absolute mystery, but we all figured it out pretty quickly. And a lot of us who hit it at that period got a lot of business very fast, right? Because like I said, clients were, were looking for, anything. This is a time when companies were being valued on the market by their burn rate, by how fast they could go through their venture capital money. <laughs> it was a crazy time to be alive. Okay. Yep. So that was, that was sort of the impetus, you know, it just really took off. And I did that for about 10 years. And then um, I got burned out, to be honest. And I sold the company to an IT firm, thinking that that would be a good partnership. Um, because they were doing a lot of, uh, government work, a lot of body shop type work, right. Asses and seats work. And, uh, they said, we want to establish a UX practice. And I thought, cool, take some of this pressure off me, right? Someone else can do a lot of logistical management stuff. I can find clients. I can do the things I'm best at. It was a, it was a command and control, very toxic environment, right? Like I was bringing them millions of dollars in accounts that they'd never seen before. And I'm out with a client having a meeting, like trying to win business. And I'm getting texts and phone calls. Like, where are you? No one knows where you are. <laughs> it was just a mess. So I remembered why I didn't want to work for anybody else. And um, I went back to independent consulting. Um, and then I think the next phase to sum this up was you to me. My wife, uh, who's a business marketing coach, Ellie, got wind of courses on you to me. And she said, you've given 8 million presentations to clients up to this point. Why don't you take one of these and turn it into a course? Throw it out there and let's see what happens. And that was, again, that was the extent of the thought. Let's throw it out there and see what happens, which I did. And pretty soon, like, okay, 100 people enrolled, 1,000 people enrolled. Like, holy shit, what's happening? And it just exploded from there. I had no, absolutely no way of knowing <laughs> that this would become, you know, what it is. It, it constantly amazes me how many people out there who are really hungry to learn, like on a daily basis. This stuff just never gets old for anybody, mm -hmm. you know, which I think is really cool. It makes me feel good. I love the fact that people are out there like more, more, give me more, right? I want to, I want to know more. I want to do more. So that, that's the stuff that gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah, that visual communication that brought back. That's what I went to school for. Um, Is it? it? It was. And it ended up, so I went to this accelerated program college and uh, they had me doing public speaking, but I was taking online classes because I was too far away from campus because uh -huh. I had moved from Anaheim, California to San Diego. So I had to do that. But then... I was enrolled in the bachelor's program and then I just dropped out for whatever reason. And at that time I had just been tinkering around starting my professional career, you know, doing freelance yeah. and yeah. Uh, I got, so I got a, an associate's degree, but the school ended up going bankrupt or filing for bankruptcy. They closed their doors, left a bunch of students out, hanging dry you know and yeah i think it turned out uh i think there was a people were 
that, that went there were actually being, uh, the loans were all forgiven, if, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. So, well, that's a good thing, at least. Were you doing, were you doing design work or were you doing, were you starting to code at that point? I was doing both, actually, because um, at the time I was learning, <laughs> I was, this brings back a lot of memories, Cork Express. I was doing yeah 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 flash and action script yeah man i was doing yeah, um uh final cut pro work you know editing here and there so i was doing a bunch of different stuff and that was when <clears throat> back when they had the uh the big max with the different colored uh i can't even remember yeah the big candy were. machines the candy yeah yeah, and we had that's what we had the big ones. We had the huge, they weighed like 80 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I remember <clears throat> in the um, HTML CSS class, Firefox was in its infancy. I think mm -hmm. it was right around it was right around version one. Mm -hmm. And I we were using Internet Explorer from Mac 5.2 on an, on the apple on the mac and i was like no let's please not do let's not do this which was horrible it was horrible <laughs> it was horrible it's the worst implementation of that browser i think i've ever seen in my entire life of any browser really for that matter their port so, to mac was so buggy yeah it was yes. unbelievably yeah. you had like i remember when we would build things you'd build something to be compatible with like you know a series of browsers and then you had to do like almost an entire different build <laughs> for internet explorer yep yep they didn't understand it and i explained it to them i said i think the school should go to firefox put firefox on these on these machines and they ended up yeah. doing that they ended up doing That's that with, to my surprise and so yeah it was just visual communication brought back a lot of memories so that's cool um Let's talk UX because that's why I got you here because I All haven't right. talked UX yet on this podcast. Um, oh boy. You mentioned the one size fits all approach. <laughs> <laughs> so what is the one size fits all approach and oh, why are oh, we oh. seeing this and why is it a myth? Here's where we get in trouble. <laughs> <sighs> Here's where I make more enemies. Um, look, I have a real problem with dogma of any kind. Okay. I always have, always will. What I see in this profession and, and what bothers me most about it is that it steers a lot of people who are new to UX in the wrong direction. It also steers clients in the wrong direction. It gives everybody this false understanding that we can come up with a UX recipe. Okay. We can come up with a process. We can come up with steps. And a wonderful diagram that cleanly explains those steps. And here's how these things take place. And we can follow the recipe and great things happen. It is absolutely unequivocally false. Every single day of my life, I see articles and videos and courses. And I swear to you, Todd, this is going to make me sound arrogant. All right. I really don't mean it to. I get like one paragraph in or I get two minutes in and I'm done already. Like I'm just... No, I'm not reading the rest of this because it's bullshit. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's again, it's like, this is, this should be your process. You follow these steps. First you do this and then you do this. Here's the problem. When you work with a client of any kind, or if you work in house somewhere, people who work in house don't need me to tell them this, they're living it. All that wonderful ordered structured shit goes right out the window <laughs> yeah. because number one, human beings are messy. Number two, organizations, the motivation of every single person involved in product design and development is different. Sometimes by design, right? Sometimes just that's just a function of people's roles. It's just a function of what each department needs to accomplish, right? It's a function of how management works. It's company um, wide mandates. It's political pressure. It's all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. None of these perfect world process, none of these one size fits all things account for any of that ridiculous movement and churn <laughs> and chaos. So every day in my life, okay, I swear to you, I, I get younger uh, UX folks and people who are new to the profession in particular are asking me, what should my process be? 
nobody likes my answer to that question. Because the real answer is you have to start somewhere with a basic framework. Okay. But you absolutely have to go down the path and be ruthless about throwing out the parts that obviously are not working. I feel that way about UX processes. I feel that way about lean, lean UX. Um, I feel that way about agile, <laughs> scrum, about uh, safer. I mean, any of these things, okay. Right. The theories behind them are very sound, right? They're all very good ideas. There, there's no article, none of those articles I'm talking about are, are necessarily bad premises. They're not. But you have to take those things and tweak and adapt based on what's working. I mean, I know teams who follow these iterative processes for development and their backlog is expanding by a factor of like 200% every week. All right. If, if you are shoving shit to the side at that magnitude, you've got a problem. All right. The things you're doing are not working. <laughs> right. And you you got to pivot. You got to change. I mean, I've been inside organizations who had stand-up meetings, for example, where it's a check-in. People read off the checklist, like, well, here's what I'm doing. I'm stuck with this, and here's what I'm going to do next. Next. There's no collaboration. There's no, okay, well, what are we going to do about that? Right? Let's pair off. Let's talk about this after this. Like, There's no activity coming out of that, that thing. So, And their meetings, because I sat in with them for three days before I opened my mouth about that their meetings would go on for like 40 minutes and i said look folks reclaim this time and do something else with it <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah 15 people don't need to stand around and listen to everybody else rattle off things that are already you know sitting in in jira or the project management software or whatever like that info's there we're not learning anything new here. We're not doing anything. Reclaim the time to do something else with it. But people and companies have a real sort of stumbling block to doing that. Everybody wants an easy answer. Students want a recipe. And I keep saying there is none, right? People get upset sometimes in my courses. They're like, well, I expected a, you know, a step-by-step thing. You have to learn this stuff you have to take it, you have to apply it, you have to try it, and you have to figure out which parks work for you in your situation with your team, with your client, with your product, your context, and you got to figure it out. There is no other recipe. Anyone who's telling you that, in my mind, is full of shit. They're lying to you. They're lying to you. It doesn't work. So that's the one size fits all thing. Okay. I just think it's a falsehood. And I think we continue as an industry to perpetuate it. Mm -hmm with all these wonderful diagrams and, and recipes and, you know, the one process that you need, like, uh, come on. Right. Messy. Yeah. It's messy. It's unpredictable. Right. <laughs> you have to have your bags packed at all times. I mean, <laughs> that's how this works. So yeah, I got a problem with that, obviously. <laughs> Remember you asked. <laughs> I did. I did. No, that was a great answer. I, so let me ask you this. Is, is that approach kind of like, oh, you know, we'll do it like Amazon or, oh, Apple does it this yeah. way. Yeah. 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 So Google. Yeah. Google, right? Well, Google does it this way. Like people, people still talk about Google's heart framework or, right. you know, right. material design or like Spotify. The whole Spotify process thing got blown up into this thing that wasn't really accurate anymore mm -hmm. <laughs> about the way that the company actually worked, you know? Um, and, and it's because people have this need to be like, um, yeah, we're going to do that because this is chaos and, and, and there's all these moving parts and we can't seem to get a handle on it. So that must be the answer. We'll do that. It's not the answer. The reason, the reason things are chaotic is because you refuse to embrace that chaos, right? You refuse to see it for what it is. You refuse to change the parts that aren't working, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Forget the dogma, forget the rules. Figure out what the hell's going on here and pivot where you need to. Mm. Because, you know, what may work for Amazon, Apple, Google, Spotify won't necessarily work for. That's right. That's right. You know, this agency or that agency. So it won't. Yeah. All of it won't. Okay. 50% right. of it might, 60% of it might, 20% of it might. 
there's no way to know. Right. It's constant. You have to pay attention and, and really, really focus on, okay, what's going well and where are we spinning our wheels? right? Where are the parts that are hanging everybody up to some degree? Where are the parts that we have a massive disconnect between us and our, and our stakeholders or us and our customers or us and our clients, right? Where are those gaps? And wherever they are, you got to stop doing whatever you're doing <laughs> in that part of the process, right? Right. Like a companies where, where teams fight with stakeholders, right? Where stakeholders are involved maybe at the very beginning and then they disappear for six weeks. And then they come back and say, well, that's not what I imagined. You know, when we talked about the requirements for this and then they throw a wrench and everything, you can't let six weeks go by without that person being involved somehow or without that person seeing something or without that person, you can't. If you allow that to happen, you are asking <laughs> for big surprises later that will suck. Right, okay? right, yeah. You just, I don't care what your process is. If that's happening, you got to change it one way or another, because you're just hurting yourself. Yeah. And that's where I think, and I think ed, that's where adversity comes in. So sure. I want, wanted to talk about that a little bit. I mean, we know, you know, I, I know a lot of people, on, you know, that don't look, that don't look like me, you know, not the white guy, not the privileged white guy. Right. That have overcome a lot. And I'm sure you have, as you know, you know, a ton of people like that as well. Um, I do. What advice would you give? So a perfect example is backpedal a little bit here. A couple of people I know have swung their career path from development because the toxicity in that part to UX and, you know, under the adversity that they, you know, have been a part of, you know, or, you know, gone through, they're doing great in that uh, category, that space of UX. Mm -hmm. So what would you, what advice would you give to someone looking to get into UX that, you know, doesn't look like me or you, you know, and <clears throat> I mean, even, you know, maybe even people that are older, you know, like me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what I, advice I think would you give those? I think it's tough on all fronts. Um, my, my, the, my advice to just about everybody usually follows two paths. Okay. Some of which sounds a hell of a lot easier than it actually is in practice. Um, number one, I, I think you have to draw very hard, very firm boundaries around what is acceptable and what isn't. Okay. In terms of the way people treat you in terms of, of these boxes that they draw around people, like you said, especially People who don't look like me <laughs> or you, yep. right? People who aren't white, uh, people who aren't men. I, I've been in plenty of rooms, okay, where, where that has happened, where I've watched conversations move around certain people in the room. Now, my particular take on that is if I'm in that room, I'm going to be the person that's a, that is going to say, well, hang on a second. You know, I think we need to hear from Janet over there, or I think we need to hear from Tyrone over there or, or, or whoever it is, uh, who, who is actually that person. Um, this young man by the name of Tyrone was, was an intern <laughs> with me many, many, many years ago. And he now works um, for a very large tech organization who, if I named, you would know. Um, and he's had a hell of a, a, a time coming up in the ranks. But what I learned from this young man is that he absolutely refuses to let people talk around him. And he is absolutely willing to make people in that room uncomfortable by saying, you know, look, I have something to offer here. And it's really starting to bother me that the conversation keeps moving around me. 
Okay. So you hired me to do this job. I'm here with you. I would like to contribute. And it makes people, I've, I've seen them do that on like three or four different occasions. And it makes people ungodly uncomfortable. But that's what needs to happen. Yes. All right. Yep. In those instances, people who get uncomfortable need to be uncomfortable. <laughs> yes. Right. So the advice back to the advice part, it's number one, you can't take anybody's shit and you cannot accept a situation where people are sort of silencing your voice. Now that's difficult and it's painful because the minute you speak out, if you're surrounded by people who are, you know, toxic <laughs> one way or the other, or, um, whether that racism is systemic or not. Mm -hmm. All right. It's usually there. So you're, you're in for a fight. The minute you do that, you're in for, in some cases, even subtle retaliation when you do that. Um, I don't know any other way. I think that's important. I think that one of the most important lessons I ever learned, I had a, I had a boss once who, apropos of nothing, ran in my office and on the whiteboard in front of me wrote in red marker, you get what you tolerate. Put the marker down, ran out. That was it. That was a sum total exchange. I never forgot those words, as yeah. cliche as they may sound. So I'm always hesitant to say these things because like I said, the minute you speak up, you're inviting war. You are. That's the hard part about all these conversations, right? About diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, but I believe that starts with empowerment. You have to absolutely refuse to accept less. You're either going to respect me or you're not. And I'm not going to allow you <laughs> to marginalize and, and silence my voice and my contribution. I'm just not going to do it. So you have to insert yourself in conversations, right? That's the first part. Um, and the second part is I, I'm, I'm writing a book on this topic right now. Um, two books, actually, if you count the one that I'm working on with um, Vincent Braithwaite, that's called Designing Difficult Conversations. Um, you have to build an inordinate amount of emotional resilience because those experiences will wear you down as anyone uh, who is a person of color or, uh, you know, has a, has a, a different gender, defines themselves differently um these people are fighting every day of their lives and they are taking a lot of it's like a ship taken on water okay mm. i mean you're 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 getting it all the time you have to build some tools emotionally to deal with that right and to keep getting up after you keep getting knocked to the canvas because that's what happens so i think those are the two parts number one you have to just refuse to, to allow anybody to treat you as less, as difficult as that is, right? Lots of people have done it. And lots of people have paid very high prices. I know some of them personally, but there is no other way. I don't think there's any other way. It's certainly on everybody else to be better human beings, right? There's no doubt about that. You talk about that a lot. Um, and, and like I said, in those situations, as a consultant, as an outside person, I'm more than happy to be that, that guy because, hey, I don't work here. <laughs> right? exactly. So it's easy for me. Yeah. I can say whatever the hell I want. Um, and if people get mad, they get mad. I don't really care. But um, those are the two parts. Okay, I think you have to accept the fact that people are not going to go quietly, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, and you can't accept that. You can't accept that as an answer. It's not an acceptable answer, right? You're a human being. You deserve respect, period. And the second part is you got to develop some sense of emotional resilience, self-care to deal with that. I watched Vivian Castillo, Castillo's talk on, um, she called it the siren call of, of self-neglect. I think it's an older talk, but I literally watched it twice yesterday morning, mm -hmm. two times in a row. It was so good. And that was a lot of what she talks about. Like you have to realize what you're taking on <laughs> if you're in that position you have to realize just how exhausting this can be and you have to make it a point 
to take care of yourself proactively. So long-winded answer, but I mean, those are my two things. That takes me back to my job search from when I left freelance into um, the, the world of, I worked at a small little place and I did front end mm -hmm. development and I also did some, oh, tried to do some UX accessibility stuff, uh, which I have a question about that we'll get to later, but. Um, that I was, mean, ageism is the same, is the same problem. Yes, yes. Oh, I had over, tw I kept a spreadsheet over the years of, of my job searching and I had over 2,200 resumes in at the time before I started at the place where I'm now and before mm -hmm. I started at Nobility, mm -hmm. it was, I was only one place had hired me and it was that place I worked to prior to these last two jobs. Mm -hmm. And I remember being interviewed by people half my age and going, <laughs> this isn't going to go well, right out right. of the gate. Right. And that's, that's where the self, a lot of big companies too, you know, it wears on you. Yeah, it does. So self-care, you know, when you said self-care, that was like, yes, that's crucial to me. And I'm sure crucial to everybody. So with that, I'm going to swing it all the way back around to toxicity because we're in tech and tech can be I don't want to say wonderful and sound like I'm starry eyed, but it can be good. It can be great. Sure. But then can. again, but, they, but then again, it can be a cesspit, you know? Yes. Um, I think those people are right in every aspect of tech, right? Yeah. UX and design included. Yes. Yes. Those people are everywhere. Yes. You know, we have gatekeeping virtual virtue signaling with, you know, everything like that. We see toxic situations, you know, misogyny and all that. I feel like I have a duty to call that out. Same. And if I say something, I need to hold myself accountable and responsible. And which is why you know, on Twitter, especially, I see, I see certain conversations and I go, no, I'm not going to jump into that one because that's, that's not absolutely not. But if I got you got to pick your moments, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. Because I never used to, you know, that's the, <laughs> oh, I, I need to insert myself into this conversation. Uh, I don't <laughs> need to insert myself into every conversation. So what can you or and I and other people do that have privilege like we do about toxicity in your opinion? Well, I, I think like, like you said, I, I think there is a duty. Um, I, I really believe this. Okay. I, I I've always felt on certain things. I cannot remain silent. I think it is an abdication of responsibility for someone like me who for better or worse, a lot of people pay attention to the things that I say. So to remain silent on certain things, I think to me, silence is agreement. Okay. So I can't say nothing. And it bothers me, quite frankly, that um, some of my, my peers in this industry choose that road. Okay. I don't, I'm not, I say that carefully. I, I'm not judging anybody for that. Okay. But it does bother me. It's disheartening. Okay. A, a lot of times when, when I sort of hope that more people, um, we'll get involved. And I do think that's changing. I think there's a, there's a whole, I think that there are a lot of people who are challenging existing thinking. And I think that's awesome. And I applaud all those people. The people I'm talking about who tend to remain silent are people my age, right? Are people who have been in this, this game for quite a while, who are the elder states people uh, in whatever way you want to define that. Um, and I think that their absence is very conspicuous mm -hmm. and, and I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. So responsibility, I think you have to call it out when you see it. I think you have to be careful about the way you do. Like you said, I'm learning just like everybody else because I am a privileged white man. Okay. 
there are lots of instances where my take is not needed. So what I do in those situations is I try to amplify other people's uh, voices, perspectives, who are really nailing it and who are coming from a place where they're experiencing <laughs> what's being talked about, right? right. That yeah. They know a hell of a lot more about it than I do. They have better answers than I do. Um, so I just, I retweet that stuff, right? Yeah. I share it. It's like noted without comment. I don't need to say anything about this. I just need more people to see it, right? So in a lot of cases, that's the better move. Um, you win some and you lose some. I mean, I've put my foot in my mouth several times. I've said things unintentionally that I didn't really realize how they were landing. And thankfully, there are people in this community who will quite kindly point it out and say, you know, I know where your heart is, but <laughs> Joe, here's, how's this, here's how this lands. And I go, oh, shit. Mm. Which is, hey, I think that's good, right? It's, it's, it's how we learn. So that's the first part. I, I think you don't have to insert yourself in everything, but I think you do have to amplify this stuff. And I think there are other times where, and I've done this and I've made enemies. I, I don't care who it is, okay? Wrong is wrong. There's certain things that I could not sit by and say nothing about, right? This whole thing <laughs> with, uh, with uh, what's her name? She's escaping me. Uh, the human factors thing. Or was it uh, IXDF? I don't think Pabini. I saw that. But Pabini stuff about... Uh... Oh, it's totally escaping me. I, I don't think I saw that. Anyway, there are, there are certain instances where I just sort of feel like I have to say loud and clear, look, this is unacceptable. Stop what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Right? And if you can't find the empathy... <laughs> in your heart, if you can't get past your own ego and your own bullshit and conditioning and whatever it is, then shut up, stop mm -hmm. talking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just be quiet. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to offer here. You know, I mean, some people are not willing to hear how it lands. I, I, I got this advice. I saw a consultant years ago when I was very young in my career and he was talking about the conversations he would have with his wife. And he said, his wife used to say to him, like when he'd say something and she would get upset, what she would say to him is, I think I understand what you're saying. Would you like to know how it landed? <laughs> right. You know, yeah. and, uh, and that was a huge lesson, right? Like you have to be willing to hear that part and change and educate yourself. If you can't do that, if you're unable to do that, shut up. Right. I've never been one to shy away from a fight um, for a long time in my personal life. That was <laughs> like <laughs> one on one. Yeah. Um, and that's just because I think certain things are unacceptable. And I think we cannot remain silent um, in certain areas. Like gatekeeping in this industry makes me absolutely batshit crazy. Yes. I hate it. I hate it. That's about privilege. That's about fear. It's about protecting my position. It's about all. Well, I'm the expert. You're nobody. Right. Okay. You're ridiculously fortunate that a lot of people happen to dig what you do, right? Or pay attention to what you do. That's, that's, that's unbelievable good fortune. Okay. I'm under no illusions about what I do. I tell people all the time, I am not the smartest person in the room by any stretch ever. I don't have any magic powers. If I got this far, anybody, in my opinion, should be able to get twice as far. Okay. All I am doing, all I ever try to do is tell the truth <laughs> in as loud a voice as, as I can muster. Right. And, and hopefully I had a conversation with Nick and Lisa recently about this. Um, and they came back to me with one word that has always been at the core of what I've tried to do. And that is give people hope. Yeah. Right. And if I can't do that, if I'm not actively trying to do that. And then I shouldn't be opening my mouth. So all this stuff about fighting back, about speaking out about things, that's really what it's about. 
I want people who are feeling that pressure, who are the targets of, of these kinds of things to know that, no, it's not cool. It's not okay. All right. And people who have a platform should be saying out loud, this is not cool. This is not okay. At the very least. I mean, it's the very least any of us can do. That's kind of, that brings me to the example of in the development world where men from all walks seem to think it's all right to slide into a woman's DMs on whether it be on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, or some other platform and use that as, a, as, as Tinder. And it's just like, don't do that. Just don't do that. What's wrong with you? Yeah. And I've it, direct messages. I've direct messaged some of those people. Yeah. Yeah. I used to be, you know, shut the fuck up, <laughs> you know, just shut right. the fuck up. Now it's more of, you know, like you said, a retweet, but I'll add men don't do this. Perfect example. Don't do this. Just don't. It's unfathomable. Okay. It's yeah. absolutely unfathomable. Yeah. If I was a woman, <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know how. I would deal with this. I mean, I wouldn't, okay? Mm. I would not deal with any of that well. Um, and it's ridiculous. It happens even in the most professional of yes. settings. Someone's given a workshop, okay? And, and people are making comments in a chat, like what the actual fuck is mm. wrong with you? Yeah, yeah. You know? It, we've lost in, in this profession web you know, whatever space it may be, we've lost a lot of brilliant women over this, you know, over, over this shit that men do, you know, thinking it's, you know, a, a dating app. It's not a dating app, you know, it, it, it's a communication tool. It, I fall back to Twitter on, uh, as an example, but it's just, you know, do you work? And like you said, keep your mouth shut. You know? Well, I mean, part of the problem is, it's culture, right? And, and not mm. just US culture, it's culture in, in different places as well, all right? Men and boys, I'll, I'll just speak for the US because that's my, my sort of sphere of, of experience. Culture for boys from a very young age um, is, is toxic in any number of ways. The messages that boys get about what it means <laughs> to be a man and how you're supposed to conduct yourself and jokes you're supposed to make with your friends, right? And here's how you fit in. And there's nothing more important to a child or a teenager in particular, right? Than fitting in, than being accepted. Exactly. And one of the ways you get accepted is by going along with stuff, even if it makes you uncomfortable, right? I went through that when I was a kid. I was a, I've always been a sensitive person, mm -hmm. okay? Sensitive, which in other words, sissy. <laughs> Is, is the label that you get, right? When yeah. you're a kid, until yep. um, I was old enough to start hitting people. Um, and I never got that, okay? There, there, there was a lot about how my friends conducted themselves that never made any sense to me. It made me uncomfortable. I didn't like it. Um, and, and I couldn't sort of sit with it and uh, abide by it. And as a result, I, I never, I, I mean, I felt isolated to some degree from my, my male friends for most of my life until I met people who are good human beings later on in life. And I think that's that toxicity, it just comes in from word go. I mean, watch an hour of TV. The stereotypes are unbelievable, right? This is the shit that people get fed. Like, it's okay. It's not okay. God almighty, it's not okay. So that stuff... It's just unacceptable. And, and, and you know, the, the, the thing about social media and, and electronically mediated conversation is that it makes everybody brave, okay? Men say things over electronic mediums that would get their teeth knocked out where they were in person, okay? Yeah. That's cowardice is what yes. that is. It's cowardice, yeah. right? So, yeah, I, I don't know how anybody deals with that. I do not know how women deal with that it's it's infuriating <laughs> and i've been on both it's, sides yeah well not at harassing women as much as you know back when and i and i freely admit 
when I talked about it to people, I was a troll back in the day in, in the early, well, in, in the mid to late nineties when IRC was still a thing. And, you know, I mm. was, I was looking for a fight where ever, cause I was angry and there were a few other right. variables right. included into that. And it just, ever, so thinking back on that, I wrote, on a little piece of paper because somebody had told me this a long time ago you know do better than you did yesterday and that that has always stuck with me and i have that right here on my desk do better than you did yesterday and it yeah when i look back at that it's like i don't feel good about myself but then i think of well you're not who you were i mean nobody's who they were right Right. I mean, I've made, I've made a lot of mistakes yeah. in my life. And I, I grew up with a lot of internalized anger from the stuff we were just talking about as well. So when I was a teenager, <clears throat> when I was old enough to get into fights, I got into fights because all that stuff needed to go somewhere. You know what I mean? And, and uh, there's nothing good about that. No, no <laughs> there's, there's nothing not. positive, nothing positive <laughs> about that. Right. Yeah. But that's kind of my point. If, if you just, you don't, you never sort of taught properly to deal with that. I think, I think boy culture, men culture is just toxic in general. It just really is. And you have to be very sure of yourself to sort of step outside it. And I think just like the, the previous conversation, I think it is on us. Um, largely to call that stuff out when we see it okay and to not accept it I've, I've done that in meetings as well right where someone would make um, a snide comment you know when a young woman in the meeting would volunteer some brilliant insights and someone would be like well i think we need to hear from somebody with a little more experience well jim I, from what I understand, and I've only been here for a week, but I think Laura does have a lot of experience. And quite frankly, she's the expert on this particular topic in this room. So I think we need to let her finish. Daggers. <laughs> right. And we're going, who the fuck is this guy? Right. Right. Yeah. I don't care. I'm a consultant. Okay. Fire me. I, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right? You want things to get better or not? This is the smartest person in the room. Shut your mouth and listen. Yep. Give me a break with this. Anyway. So I don't know where I'm going at this point. <laughs> Just venting. There's, there's an awful lot of similarities that I'm hearing between yourself and me. So yeah, I, I get it. Um, I guess that kind of brings me to the resilience piece too, where, you know, we just, we talked about adversity, you know, and, and I've had to sometimes explain to people adversity and resilience while they can be the same, they're a little different. That's right. Um, That's so right. like with my instance as a, I mean, an example, off the top of my head, you know, I can't do coding interviews right off the bat because I freeze up. My brain instantly tells me you're going to fail. Yep. And I have failed a ton, a sure. ton of those interviews. Um, and it's exhausting. You know? um, but I've seen people and I know people who are, you know, they just... They go through those interviews or they go, they go through those interviews that you and I hate where they're in. Oh, well, we have six interviews that you need to do in a four hour period. And yeah, uh, they, they make it all the way through. They're resilient and then they don't hear anything for a month. And then they hear back, well, you know, that automated email while we loved your resume and, you know, appreciate all your experience we decided to go with another candidate, you know, well, fuck you. This is what I was yeah, Right. Um, right. And it's rude. I mean, to, to leave somebody hanging for that long and not communicate with them all, that's a whole other topic. Um, but yeah, come on. Yeah. So I guess my question is, 
you know, and again, you and I have seen a lot of resilient people. What can we learn from those people about resiliency? Because I'm still learning how to be resilient uh, after, you know, it's yeah. over 20 years for me being a professional. Um, I'm still learning. from these people. Right. And that doesn't stop. Okay. And that's the, the important thing that you just said is the key. That doesn't stop. You don't get to a point where you are now Like I have reached full saturation of resilience. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I've got it now. Um, It doesn't work that way. It's, it's a constant rethinking, refueling, re like, like sort of re remembering like, okay, here's what I have to do here. Um, Yeah. Like you. Okay. I, I have struggled with, with a lot of things all my life um, with anxiety, with depression, with, um, ADD, attention deficit, right? Which as a kid was never diagnosed. So what would happen to me is I could always do the homework. I could always do the in-class work. Straight A's, no problem. When I did standardized tests, I tested like three or four grades ahead of where I was constantly. The minute I had to take a test, the minute I had to remember something, right? Or or memorize things, C's, D's, F's in a lot of cases, okay? Math in particular, where you had to memorize all these formulas, right? For algebra in order to take the test. And if you couldn't remember the formula, well, guess what? You're fucked Mm -hmm. when you take the test. Right. So I would get A's on my homework and D's on tests. Yep. (laughs) Right. And every teacher I ever had was like, doesn't apply himself. (laughs) And I'd be like, I can't remember any of this shit. And no one was sort of buying that. Well, when I was in my (laughs) thirties, A therapist said to me, have you ever been tested for different forms of attention deficit? I said, no, I've never even considered it. I said, okay, well, let's, let's go through this. And they walked me through the test and my numbers are off the chart. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. And that's literally, it's, it's like up until that point, I started therapy and meds. It was like having 12 different radios on at the same time. And each one of them is tuned to a different station. And you have no choice as to which you can pay attention to. And remembering things, memorizing things, impossible. Absolutely, positively impossible for me. Still is to this day. Um, So that was the light bulb moment. Okay. That was, all right, number one, there's an answer to this. And number two, I have to find a way to adapt. And what I have learned over the years from that experience from very difficult life experiences, from very very difficult work experiences. You have to accept the fact that life is going to hand you some difficult shit. It's going to hurt. You're going to get hit repeatedly. I don't think that's different for anybody. People who don't admit to that are lying. Okay. I, I think that everybody pays one way or another. In, right, constantly. I yeah. just, that's my belief. Everybody pays two words. It's one of my mantras. Um, you have to accept that. Part of the pain that we experience um, is by insisting that it shouldn't be this way, right? Or insisting that it should be some other way. It can't be any other way than the way it is, right? Buddhism as well has helped me a lot with this. The first tenet of Buddhism is pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional, right? The theory is that suffering comes from our refusing to accept the situation as it is. You got to train yourself to say, all right, that happened. Yeah. (laughs) Pretty terrible. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know how I'm going to get through the next moment. And sometimes all you know how to do is put one foot in front of the other or breathe in and breathe out and continue to tell yourself to do those things until it becomes natural again. Right. And you don't have to think about it. There is no other way, but it's, it's a constant process. Like I said, you don't reach a point where you're suddenly magically resilient to everything that comes your way. It's training and it's practice. It's like everything else. Okay. It's like exercising or it's like practicing your craft. You have to do it over and over and over and over again. So that at the very least, your response becomes somewhat automatic, like, okay, that shit. <laughs> What's the very next thing? Right. Like my father always says that he's an engineer, carpenter. Um, 
he never looks too far ahead in any situation. It's like, all right, what's the very next thing I have to do here? And that's as far as my focus goes, you know? And that to me is the only answer. And you also have to realize, I think that most people don't realize how strong they really are. If you really sit down, and I mean this for anybody who's listening or watching right now, if you really sit down and take stock of all the shit that you have been through, right? At this point in your life, take stock of all of it. You're still here. Okay. You're still here. Whatever it is, whatever has taken place, you still exist. Okay. That means you made a conscious decision to say, I'm going to move through this shit. Your ability to move through all that shit and still be standing and being able to carry a conversation <laughs> is testament to your strength. That is the definition, to use a cliched term, that is the definition of a warrior. That is what a warrior does. A warrior is not a victor, okay, necessarily, who like conquers all odds very easily. No, a warrior is someone who takes those beatings <laughs> over and over and over again and says, you know what? You can hurt me, but you are not going to break me. It's not going to happen. Okay, I've had days where I've said that out loud to nobody, like to the sky, literally. All right. I've looked up in the air and, and said, you're not going to break me. Not going to happen. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to deal with this, but you are not going to break me. Seriously. Sometimes that's all I got. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I mean, that's what it is. There's no magic secret. Mm. There is, you have to believe in your own ability to transcend, which in most cases, you've already proven that you have. You just don't realize it. You know? I mean, it, like your case, you, you mentioned a minute ago, looking for a job. What did you say? 2,000 resumes? Right? How many doors slammed in your face? How many, how many people ghosted you or couldn't be bothered to get back to you? All right? That's painful yeah. over and over and over again. A lot of folks I know who talk to me on a weekly basis are going through the same thing. There's only one answer to that. You have to keep going. And you have to realize that eventually it will come. Why? Because you're good enough to do it, period. If you were good enough to get a job in the past, you're good enough to get a job now, period. People who are new in positions, right? I just got this job and I feel overwhelmed. And I'm like, That's okay. But if you got the job, that means you were good enough to get the job, right? If you're working every day, you're good enough to do that work, period. That's why you're there. You have to remind yourself of these things. And I think we as human beings are really lousy <laughs> at doing that, right? At giving ourselves any credit <laughs> for what we've been able to accomplish, what we've been able to beat and survive and transcend. So the, to me, Todd, that, that's really all it is. Yeah. Yeah. And so this kind of tied in, ties into, well, it does tie into my next question. You know, when, when going for those interviews, whether it be, you know, the, in my case, development or what, whatnot. And with the people that, you know, you have in, in, your, in your courses, taking your courses in UX, you know, how can they best prepare themselves to not come out of that interview going, oh, you know, that, that was probably the worst interview ever. Right. Um, I think that, I think you have to do it this is kind of always my advice, right? I think you have to remember a couple of things. Number one, you also have to remember that you're interviewing them and you have yeah. to treat those interviews as that, right? So you do have to, I think, really work to turn the tables a little bit and ask as many questions as they ask you about how they work. How does work move, move through this organization? Who approved this, right? How does, how does a request start? Who does what? How do developers and designers work together? Any number of questions. Right. What happens when people have life events or people get sick or right? You have to put yourself in the mindset of I am qualifying them. They need to be good enough for me as well. Yeah. That's yeah. absolutely true. Okay. Nobody talks about that for reasons I don't understand. That that's part of it. The other part of it is when it comes to like the challenges part, right? Or they're like, what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? Then that's your answer. 
Okay. I don't know the answer to that. I can't yes. tell you how many interviews I've heard about people have told me about where client companies are asking questions like, we have a situation that's like this. How would you, how would you deal with this? There's only one answer to that question because you've only been in the room for 10 minutes. Okay. You know this much about this organization and their work and their clients. The only acceptable answer is, to be honest with you, I don't know enough about your company or your clients or this product or how it's performed historically or any number of things to give you a good answer. What I can tell you is here are the areas I would need to look into. <laughs> here are the questions I would have for people who work here. Here are the questions I would have for customers, right? In order to answer your question. That's the right answer. Not coming up with some bullshit that you think they want to hear. It's not going right. to serve you at all, no. right? They're not going to get the answer that, that they want either. And anyone who wants a bullshit answer out of you, it's not a place you want to work, no. all right, for any number of reasons. Yeah. Um, the other thing about interviews like challenges, I, I had a mentoring session with a young lady a week ago who said, they're doing this thing, they call it a whiteboard challenge, but what they really want me to do is they want me to use software and like design as they, as we go through this, this challenge in two hours and their laundry list of shit that they wanted her to touch was, was way too long. Mm -hmm. And I said, look, I would email this person back and say, based on what you're asking, if I do this with the software, I, I'm only going to address maybe 10% of this because the rest of my effort is going to be just trying to arrange shit on the screen and like doing the things that need to be done. If you allow me to do this with pen and paper instead, right, with a webcam on my, on my desk, that'd be a hell of a lot more accurate, okay? It'd be more relevant. It would allow me to think through and work through these problems. It would allow us to collaborate better, any number of things. And I said, you should say that. They may accept that they may not. Um, and even then, if they don't, you still have to do that session the way you think it should be done. Ask questions. They're like, what if, she's like, what if I'm not allowed to ask questions? I said, there's no such thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You ask the question, what happens when, all right, that's a real world situation. If you're going to put me in a situation where I have to do a design challenge, okay, and you're going to give me this premise problem I have to solve. I'm going to treat it like a real world thing, which means there are other humans in this room. I'm going to ask you questions right. about the things that I don't know so that I can do some relevant work. And fuck you if you have a problem with that. <laughs> exactly. I'm very serious. All right. Yeah. It's, that's, I, I tell candidates this all the time. Just because they give you parameters doesn't mean that those parameters make sense. It doesn't mean that you automatically have to obey them. Okay. You got to get real. If you hired me, here's what you're going to get. <laughs> So you got to do it the way you think it should be done and don't make any apologies about that. And don't lie out of your ass. Right. It right? Doesn't if, they work. Ask you a ridiculous, if they ask you a ridiculous question that you can't possibly answer, you need to politely say, <laughs> I don't have nearly enough information to answer that question. It's premature in this case. Yeah. Up until last, right yeah, up until last year, I always thought, that I needed to answer every question from an from an, a, a potential employer, and which is normal. Yes, and it never got me the job. Never, not once. Um, no. When I start, when I found out, uh, <laughs> it's okay to say I don't know when asked mm -hmm. the question. That's when those interviews got easier a little bit for me to just say, you know, I don't know that, but I can find out. I know how to do the research to find out, or That's right. I will That's ask right. somebody. That's right. That knows. Um, yeah. Yeah. That approach changed the way I, I, I dealt with clients as well. Yeah. All right. I found that I got better clients, but long-term clients. When I started ignoring these ridiculous questions that they asked me in our very first conversation yeah. about what they should do, there's no yeah. way I'm giving you an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No way. Cause then you're going to go do it. And you're going to go, well, Joe told me, sorry, <laughs> not going there at all. Yeah, no. Right. right. Speaking yeah, of so you're absolutely correct. 
Yeah. Yes. It, it just, it got easier when I started saying, I don't know. And then asking questions too, up until again, last year, mm -hmm. I never, I would, okay. I shouldn't say I never, I rarely asked questions. Rarely did I ask them, how much is the job? How much is the salary? Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. that one, maybe even, um, what's an average work week. Yeah. But then I got some enlightenment from our friends, Mike Montero and Erica Hall. Right. Kings of the free world. Kings and queens <laughs> of the free world. <laughs> During I love them imp both. Yes. Yes. During an impromptu Zoom pep talk that uh, Mike dragged me into um, with a few other people he knew right before I interviewed for a job, I ended up not getting the job, but it was an experience that I won't forget because I asked the questions that were suggested that I give. And I was like, holy shit, this is mm -hmm. so much easier than trying to not only bullshit my way through an interview and try to answer everything, yep. but asking more than just one or two questions. Yeah. So, yeah. And see that, I think that's the key. Okay. I, I've always been that person. When I started my own firm, when we wrote proposals, um, my proposals were always, they were long. They would be like 18 pages, 20 pages. And I was packing education in there. Basically I was, I was sort of given a mini class inside the proposal of here's all the shit that you really need to think about. <laughs> if you want to do this and you want to achieve these things that you're telling me you want to achieve. Um, the clients who appreciated that were the best clients. They paid the most. They were the easiest to work with. They were the most collaborative. They were the most interested, right? And the most engaged in the process. When we used to respond to RFPs, the rule in the world of responding to RFPs is you must go by the letter of the RFP. If they ask for something in a very specific way, a very specific format, that's exactly what you provide. I never did that. <laughs> I mean, I would, I would, I would follow 70% of the rules. And then for other things, like they would ask a question, like you have to respond to this question. And my response would be, there's no possible way I can answer that. And, and trying to answer it would do you a disservice because I would be guessing, which essentially means and you're not supposed to do that with RFPs. Like you're not allowed to deviate. And a lot of times that got my proposal thrown out completely because some companies are like, well, they didn't follow instructions. Other people were like, you know what? You were the only person out of 65 people who said this. Talk to me about that. All right, now we're in business. So I have you, a you lot- You gotta believe that your way is okay. Yeah. I have a lot more questions, but I am running <laughs> short on time because I have an eight. No, that's my fault. I talk a lot. No, 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 not your fault at all. I am. This is actually, this has been an awesome conversation and I expected an awesome conversation going into this. So this is cool. right, right where I thought it would be. Would you like to do a part two? Yes. And we can schedule that for, uh, you know, whenever next week or whenever you have time to, to do that. Absolutely. Um, Cause work calls <laughs> and I have a stand. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. <laughs> but yeah, actually no problem. I would, I would love to do more. Yeah. No problems. Why don't I just squeeze one more in? Cause I still have a few, few minutes left here. So Go for it. I, I wanted to touch upon that, you know, we were talking, you know, you were discussing clients, difficult clients, and how to deal with them. Uh, I've learned, and again, I I go back to Mike Montero's "fuck you, pay me" talk, which is brilliant. Still, I think to it's like the day. Ten Commandments, right? I mean, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I live by that rule. Uh, what, without going into much detail is the worst case that you, or the worst example of a client that was very difficult for you. And what did you do in that situation to, I guess, yeah. 
you know, remedy the situation or cut ties. Well, I don't know if it was, yeah, I don't know if it was the worst. Okay, but but it hammered this lesson home. I had mentors when I first started my business. I there's an older guy by the name of Ed Gold who was my mentor. I really looked up to. He was sort of a big name locally here, um, in particular. Um, and he was kind enough to sort of take me under his wing. We used to go to lunch, and I used to bitch to him right about clients and all of a sudden. And he used to tell me all the time. He used to say, "Joe, you have to fire bad clients. Mm. You cannot put up with this shit." You either you lay down the law and say, this is what you agreed to be a contract. You either honor your end or we're done. And you say mm-hmm. it diplomatically and politely, but that's basically the thing. It took me years before I was able to take that advice because at that point, you're like, how dare I turn down work? Like, who the hell do I think I am? And you're struggling because you're trying to pay bills. Anyway, I had this woman who was a client. In my contracts, they were, they were fixed fees, okay? And they were set out at very certain milestones. So she knew up front exactly what she was going to pay. I did not ever deviate from those numbers, ever, not once. For a period of two years, every single invoice I sent her, she would fax back to me. This is the age of fax machines. She would fax it back to me, and it would, the amount would be circled. I would say, <laughs> why is this so expensive? I'm like, you fucking agreed to this in a contract. You knew what it was going to be. What do you ask? Anyway, I, in that example, and I spent an inordinate amount of time handholding with her, on the phone with her, answering to these ridiculous emails, questioning the work, like things that we already discussed. Right. And then she'd change her mind 45 times. Mm. So I'm spending all this extra time, right, to the tune of like an additional four hours a day just dealing with this one person, time I'm not getting paid for. Finally, after two years of this, I finally... I had a conversation with her by phone. I said, look, I can't do this anymore. I laid out the situation. You know, I've, I've done everything I can to accommodate you. That's obviously not working. Okay. You're, you're insisting that things should be this way. They're not. And I cannot spend all this additional time anymore. So I think it's best that we part ways. And she was shocked, shocked that I would fire her. Like, you can't fire me. I fire you. <laughs> that kind of thing. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 And, um, it was the most liberating thing I had ever done. And I never looked back from that point. From that point, it's like, we're going to set expectations very clearly up front. My contracts are very simple and very clear. And everything everybody's responsible for is lined out. The minute someone doesn't do what they said they're supposed to do, I simply say, per contract, you know, you, you owe us this and work is going to stop until that gets taken care of. And that's it. I don't debate it. I don't want to talk about it. I don't have conversations about it. It's a statement of fact. And I do it unemotionally, right? I don't argue. I'm literally unwilling to have that conversation. That's how I approach this. This is what you agreed to. I'm holding up my end. I need you to hold up yours. That's all. That's all. And you cannot for a minute entertain anything else. Right. Period. And, and again, you, you have to, I think the key to that is, I say this all the time to people, you have to do it. I learned this from my lawyer, Elliot Wagenheim, who's a friend of mine. Um, we've been working together for like 20 years. He, he always told me, he said, when you respond to people, it cannot be emotional. You cannot be pleading your case. You simply say, I've held up my end per this contract. I need you to hold up yours. And until that happens, everything's on pause. That's it. That's all you are ever willing to say on the subject. That's it. I remember so that's my, my approach. I remember my first firing of a client and they had brought in somebody that not only looked at the work that I was doing, but manipulated it a little bit. And I was like, mm-hmm. no, that's it. We're done. We are done. Right. Right. It's, it's like you said, liberating, you know? Oh, wasn't it liberate because they were not only that micromanagement the 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 owner of this company would send me emails at one every half hour 45 minutes how's it coming along how's it coming yeah along? see exactly exactly that's distrust I, right? yeah yeah that's someone and, who doesn't trust you yeah, and it, it was almost like having that person over my shoulder, which, again, 
I can't, I, I, I don't know how many, going back to the interviews, I don't know how many interviews when it was doing in-person interviews where I had somebody looking over my shoulder, I'm trying to code and it's like, I, I, dude, I can't do this. This, I've actually walked out of interviews because I, mm -hmm. I, I can't have somebody over my shoulder, so. Right, right. Yeah. Like there are things that I refuse to accept, okay? For yeah. example, um, I've had a couple clients, this has happened to me three or four times in my career in the last uh, you know, 30 years where you have people who are angry for whatever reason, they hate their lives. Um, and they'll call and you pick up the phone and instead of hello, you get screaming mm. on the other end. I have only ever responded to that one way. And that's with two words. We're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and I'm done. Funny. I'm literally done. We're not working together anymore. Okay. Right. You can have your deposit back. I don't give a fuck. We're done. You that's do unacceptable. That yeah, I'm not going to lecture you about how you shouldn't lose your temper. You're an adult. Yeah, we're done. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, with that, why don't we go ahead and uh, I'll we can stop right here. We'll get scheduled for the second part um, because, like I said, I have a it, lot more questions. Yeah, I might be able to do it next week. Um, okay. As a matter of fact, so let me know. Or should I just take a look at your, your calendar? How do you want to do this? Um, yeah, go ahead and take a look at the calendar and uh, we'll get something in there um, at some point. But <clears throat> for right now, though, uh, I will just do my little outro here. Uh, thank you, listeners, for tuning into the Front End Nerdery podcast. I'll be back next time with a new guest. Well, no, I won't be back with a new guest because we're coming <laughs> back to do the second part of this. See, we got more to talk about. We got a lot more to talk about. It's yes, indeed. Um, so I'll be back next time with my guest Joe Natoli here. We will have more conversation about a lot of different things that I have questions of on uh, as far as UX goes and some other stuff um, as well. And uh, yeah, so if you would awesome. please rate this podcast on your podcast device of choice, like, subscribe, and watch on the Front End Nerdery YouTube channel. Links to transcripts and show notes are there. I'm Todd Liberty, and this has been the Front End Nerdery podcast. Thanks, and we'll see you next time with the second half of this uh, interview. So we'll see yeah. you then.